Hi there, my name is Jack Burgess. Uh, if you've been following this series of YouTube videos, welcome back. Uh, what I want to do today is kind of give you a tour of the structures that are on my layout. This is what I do if I have two or three people come to visit. I will walk them around the layout, point out buildings, tell stories, and so forth. So I want to do that today. There's just about a hundred structures on the layout. About half of them are styrene, a little over half. Every single one of them is scratch built. Uh, I have no kits with one exception, and I'll talk about that exception later. When I started this layout in 1980, I had two structures that were already built and that fit in and that I felt were good enough quality. Uh, I'm going to talk about both of those first. Uh, the very first one was the station at Merced. That was the main station for the Yosemite Valley Railroad. I actually had very few photos when I built my copy of the Merced station, and I was using this photo and one other photo and I think what I did is, as I recall was I used the height of a person in that first photo and used that to scale the entire building and the proportions seemed like they were right so it was on my layout for a long time I never built the building that was next to it which was the freight house which is shown in this photo because that was the only photo I had of it I had no information on the sizes or whatever so Eventually, uh, I was able to get a tracing of the original drawing that was used for that particular station. It was a tracing that was done by a person that was actually a draftsman for the Yosemite Valley Railroad. And um, someone else found out about it. Uh, he had an article in the uh, Narrow Gage Short Line Gazette, which included this drawing. And I got hold of the editor and got contact information for the person, went down and got a copy of that drawing. And so then I used that drawing, drew it up in CAD, which is computer-aided drafting, um, partly because I, I just love drafting. I've done drawings for just about every building on this layout before I build them, and as I'm doing the drafting, it gives me a chance to check things. Does it look right? Are the proportions correct? How am I going to build this? So I kind of pre-build it in my mind when I'm drawing it up. So I drew up the plans for both the station and the freight house. And when I was ready to um, build the freight house, what I did is I took my drawing and came out and put it up against the building like this. And look, it's too tall. This is exact scale from the drawing by the, the railroad draftsman. This is my model. So the only solution was to then build the freight house too tall. And I wouldn't do that. I would not build a, pro a building that I knew was wrong right off the bat. So I had to build a new building. When I got it done, I was ready to throw this away. And my wife said, no, you don't. You've got to keep it. And so she was right. Uh, she had a good point. So this is my second version of the Merced station uh, with the freight house. Uh, again, all styrene, all scratch built. The first model I built, because it was bigger, the windows were bigger, and I actually had interior detailing of this office, this office, one back here. This one I couldn't do it because the windows were so small. You would actually look through the windows on the other one, push a button, turn the lights on, and so forth. So this one, I still wanted to have some interior detailing. So down here are two periscopes. They come up and one looks into the dispatcher office back here, the other looks into the ticket office here. What you could also do is look through here and watch trains go by, just like you're inside the building. One of the things I recognized when I was designing my layout is that with one exception, every single station on the railroad is facing north and we're looking from the south toward the north. So you're seeing, always seeing the backside of stations, and you'll see two or three other stations the same way. Um, but being a prototype model, there was no way that I was going to turn the station 180 and put it on the other side of the tracks. It, it just wouldn't work. So one thing that you're seeing now that no visitor has ever seen on this layout is the front of this particular station at Merced. It looks a lot like the street side, but it gives you a different view, um, which is kind of neat. I mentioned that when I started my layout, I had two buildings already built that were up to standards. The second one was the roundhouse, completely scratch built. 
first problem I had was the only thing I knew was that it was 79 feet long. It was deep. I didn't know how wide it was. I didn't know the angle of the tracks, so forth. So what I did is I had a photo that somebody had taken standing on the turntable looking into the building directly up the tracks. And if you know the width of something in the photo, you can determine the rest. What do we know? We know the track gauge. We know that's four feet, eight and a half inches. And so I measured on the photo what the gauge was and then compared that to the distance between the posts and calculated those at 15 feet or 16 feet, somewhere around there. Turns out later they were 15 feet apart. Uh, so from that I could get the height, from that I got the height of the building and so forth. This was going to be a contest model. Uh, back in the 70s, 80s, I was really into contest modeling, not for winning awards, but for pushing myself. And so for this building, I included every single machine that they had in the building. In the research video I mentioned, I had a list. The, um, the person that was going to sell everything listed everything on a liquidation notice, and he listed a 14-foot lathe, for example. A friend of mine had a turn-of-the-century tool catalog, we're talking 1900, and we would find a drawing for a particular item that was in the list, photocopied it, and made some assumptions. And so uh, that's how I got all of the machines done for that building. The real problem is I've never been a machinist, and so how to, figuring out where they might logically be located in the building, I didn't have a clue. What did happen, though, was interesting, is the owner of Rio Grande Models was visiting after I built the roundhouse and saw all those tools and machines, machine tools in there and started coming out with detailed parts for them, and those are still available. When I built the building, especially since it was going to be a contest model, the roof came off, so you can see inside the building. Uh, there's a little lean-to on one side, and I think that was for lockers for the people that work there. I really don't know. So I modeled that too. Um, but many times I get carried away on these projects. And so I built a little table in there and I added a little bitty sandwich with one bite out of it, which you can see in this photo. And then I made a Coke bottle. And I was turning the Coke bottle on my lathe with 10 power magnifiers on, looking at a regular Coke bottle and duplicating the, the curvature I got it all right, I used a cutoff tool, cut it off, and it dropped into all the chips, and I lost it for at least 20 minutes while I was trying to find it. So I used to have the roof off sometimes, but finally it just became a, a problem because anytime I took a, a picture for a magazine article or something, there was this big gap between the roof and the building, so I glued the whole roof on. So now photos are the only proof that it has an interior detailing. Okay, now I want to talk about another building that I, I built two copies of it before I got it right, and that's the oil tank here at Merced. Uh, the first one I built, I built it using construction paper to actually create the seams between the, the panels around the tank. And I was proud enough of it that I wrote an article for RMC, which they published. But later, the paper seams were just way too obvious. Uh, and I was not satisfied with it. So I decided to build a new one, and um, the proportions of the second one, the current one, are much better. I think I've got them right this time. I didn't have that much information on the first one. So for this oil tank, what I did is I used a piece of PVC pipe for the tank itself, painted it gray, and then made a decal that went completely around the tank, had all the seams, all of the rivets, and the lettering on the tank itself that way. I made a list recently of all the buildings that I've built at least two models of. This next one I've actually built three models. The first one I built a long time ago, I knew that there was an oil house in the Merced Yards. And the oil house is to store inflammable materials, so forth. Um, I knew the size from the liquidation notice. Said it was 19 by 24 foot brick building or whatever but I had no photos. Finally, I had this particular photo, and I think, once again, this is the only photo I'm ever gonna get, so I built this model from that one photo and the size of the building. 
That was also in an article in RMC. Then several years, many years later, I got this really poor photo of when the yard was being scrapped and you can see the oil house in the background. The photographer is near the turntable and as you can see in the photo, the wall that faces the turntable has a window. So I built this particular building. Then a friend of mine that wanted to build that building uh, pointed out that in this Sanborn map, you can see that the long dimension is the, the side of the building with the peaked roofs. That's not how most buildings are built. You always have the narrow side with the peaked roofs. So that meant that I needed to build a third model, which is this one. Now, I also changed the first two models. I used some embossed styrene to duplicate the bricks. There was a good modeler who had an article in RMC about using that material and you would paint it and then you would add uh, plaster of Paris or something like that uh, in the grooves or between the bricks and then wipe most of it away. That didn't work for me at all. So what I did on this final model is I found a picture online looking straight at a brick wall. I grabbed that photo, used Photoshop to make a whole sheet of that pattern. So what you're seeing on the building is paper glued to a wood frame. I'm just going to mention this other big building here in the yards. This is the stores building. Uh, if you think about it, a railroad cannot order what they need on Amazon back in those days. You had to have it on site. So toilet paper for the passenger cars, um, lanterns, extra parts, nuts and bolts would all be stored here. There were also some offices in here. I think the superintendent of motor power had an office in here, so forth. This is one building, one of the few buildings that when I was building my layout still existed. I didn't know it. I was down talking to Al Rose, who was a YV fan and so forth, and he told me where the building had been moved. So they actually sold it when the railroad was being scrapped and moved it to another location in Merced. So I went down and I was actually able to measure the building, took a lot of photos, uh, and so forth. So I only had to build it once. So another situation where I ended up building three models before I got it correct is for this interlocking tower. This is where the YV crossed the Santa Fe. And the first model I built, um, actually I built it for the previous layout. So we're talking a long time ago. And I did the best I could. It wasn't that good. And I didn't have enough information. So it was never even used on this layout. Then my skills got better, I got some more photos, built a second one, this particular model, and it looked fine. Um, some things I uh, looked later, as I got more photos, I could see a, a few errors, but the biggest problem was the color. And I got the color of the building from this color photo that was taken after abandonment. And I was, I built my current model, and I was I've told people I was shaking the paint, which is pretty close. I was ready to paint the building, and I was only concerned about the trim color based on this color photo. So I emailed three people that modeled the Santa Fe, and I only got a response, or the first response was a friend of mine that lives the next city over, and he said, Jack, don't you have a photo that shows the building being a different color? And I said, yes, and it's this photo. And I can never understand why it was a dark color rather than the light color that was in the other dozen photos I had. And so when he said the Santa Fe originally had a different color, I went online, I found a color photo of a restored station in Colorado, which was red with green trim. I grabbed that, changed it to a black and white photo in Photoshop, and it matched what I was seeing in this other photo. So this is the correct colors for 1939 because the other photo was taken in 41. In Merced, I built every building that was in the yards. This is Merced Falls, which was a lumber company town. There's a huge lumber mill, which would be here in the aisle. And they had a lot of buildings, and I had to be selective about what I wanted to build. This is one of them. I was leaving space in my layout plan for this building. This is about a quarter the size of the prototype building. There was just no way that I could shrink it. So what I built is actual size, but it extended way back and way to the other side. I had a few photos of this, 
But I also had a Sanborn map, which I showed in the clinic on research. What I didn't share was I also had, as part of a Sanborn map, cross sections of this building. So those gave me a sense of height, to how, how big things were. I actually spent four days drawing plans for this in uh, computer-aided drafting or CAD. Once I had those plans done, I built the entire model in one day. It's all styrene. It just went really fast. There's no windows. There's some door openings. There's a, a door here, but it went pretty fast. And so what this was is this is the building that they planed the rough wood to get it ready for sale. They also, the company ClearCut, it wasn't that well known, but people, that's just how they did things in those days. So they cut, the prime wood was sugar pine. That was clear wood for the first 30 feet up the trunk. That was the stuff that drain boards were made out of, uh, window trim, things that had to be absolutely clear, no knots. Doug fir was a strong building material, they cut that. And they also cut cheap pine. And the cheap pine was used to make boxes and uh, because that's before corrugated boxes. So everything you get today in a corrugated box came in those days in a wood box. And a company would make an order and say, we want a thousand boxes this size by this size, uh, completely solid or whatever. And the railroad would, or the lumber company would make those. And instead of assembling them there, they stamped them if the person won their name on the side or whatever, and then they bound them up and shipped them to the factory, and the factory would assemble them into boxes. So those were called box shooks, and that's what this is. This building was just solid, filled with wood that needs to be shipped off the, by the railroad to places all over the United States. Another building that I built, and I did have a few photos, no dimensions on, is the hotel. And it took me a long time to figure out why you would have a hotel in a lumber company town. And I finally realized what we think of as a hotel is not what they thought it was a hotel. You didn't have salesmen coming in and staying the night here and then going in and negotiating prices. This is for single men that had good paying jobs because they didn't have any cooking utensils. They didn't have anything. You know, you would come to a town like this with just your clothes. So they stayed in the hotel because they got their meals there. And people that didn't make that much money were in very, very small places down here with outdoor toilets, maybe one shower, and they took their meals in the dining hall. I mentioned before that there is one kit on the layout, and this is it. It's the station at Merced Falls. It's a kit because I put off building it for a long time. And... Um, had a lot of windows, a lot of complications and so forth. I had drawn up plans for it. That wasn't the issue. But I was talking to Andy Sprandio, and this is about uh, 15, 20 years ago, at a National Model Railroad Association convention. And since I like styrene, people were coming out with laser-cut kits in those days out of wood. And I didn't, want build, I didn't want to build it out of wood. And talking to Andy about it, he says, oh, um, a friend of ours has found a company that will laser cut styrene. So I got in touch with that guy. He put me in touch with the company. I never met the guy, told him what I was interested in. And um, he said, yes, I can do that. And he sent me a little, little bitty structure, maybe this big, um, that was all laser cut. And it was clean. It, there was no burn marks. It was like it had been cut out with an X-Acto knife. And I saw these little s slots and tabs, which I had never knew existed because I'd never bought a kit before. And so all these big kits have these little slots and tabs that you put everything together. So I, I asked him how wide his laser was because I wanted to compensate for the window openings so they would fit in there and not be sloppy. So I drew up all the sides as individual pieces, everything that had to be laser cut, all of the roof pieces. And then um, I was talking about this on a Yosemite Valley Railroad chat list and uh, several other people were interested in buying one of these kits, limited production kits, I guess you would say. So we ended up ordering about eight or nine kits. I sent all the materials to them. I ordered all the styrene from Evergreen. Later, I was talking to Evergreen because I knew the owner. And he said, Jack, you should have told me that you were going to turn around and ship it to, call it to uh, another place to be cut because I could have shipped it directly there and saved you money. But 
he, the guy that was going to laser cut my um, all these kits, said, "Tell you what I'll do is if you give me a copy of your book, which had come out maybe a year earlier, I will cut all the stuff for that price." And my cost for the books was thirty nine dollars, so he cut all the parts for eight or nine kits for thirty nine dollars. So the cost to uh, the other members that wanted these was, as I recall, maybe about eighty dollars because I had every single piece of styrene, all the windows, all the doors, all the strip styrene. I um, turned a master for the uh, smokestacks on my lathe and made uh, castings out of those with um, casting resin. So you could say this is a kit. So that wraps up this segment. This was the first level of my layout. Next time we will go to the second level and look at structures up there. <laughs>